We, in the introduction, in the first class, we discuss three common misconceptions of the Gita that people have. The first one, that the Gita is the Bible of Hinduism. The Gita is not the Bible of Hinduism. The Bible is a great scripture. Gita is a great scripture. They're completely different. Comparing the Gita and the Bible is comparing a pineapple and a mango. They're completely different. You can't compare them. Both great scriptures, but completely different. Second mistake. People say that the Gita is a scripture of Hinduism. No, the word Hinduism is not contained anywhere in the Gita. In fact, even in the Gita, people say it's Sri Krishna talking. Throughout the entire Mahabharat, it says whenever Krishna says something, it says Krishna Uvacha. In the Mahabharat, it's Sri Bhagavan Uvacha. So that's the difference. It's not Krishna talking, it's God. Whoever you want to call God, that's God talking. Third misconception, Gita is a book for samyasis. Oh, go back to the Hinduism. All right, Charlotte, where does the word Hindu come from? <coughs> Hindu is a Persian word. In ancient times, people living around the river Sindh, there was a civilization there. The Persians saw this civilization. The Persians didn't have a word for S, so they call it Hind instead of Sindh. And hence the word Hindu came about. Hey, Shika. Hence the word Hindu um, came about. So now it's there, the name is there, that's fine. But our religion wasn't called, it's not even religion, it's Dharma. It wasn't called Hinduism, it was called Sanatan Dharma, which means that without beginning. If something has no beginning, it has no end. No one's been able to trace back the date of the Rig Vedas, ancient scriptures. You know when the Gita is written, we know when the Ramayana was written. Uh, no one knows where the Vedas were written, the Rig Veda and so on. Hence what we call is Sanatan Dharma, that without beginning. That was the introduction. Went to the first verse, Trushasha Uvacha, Kurukshetra, Dharma Shetra, Kurukshetra. The first word in the Gita was Dharma. The last word of the Gita is Mama. Dharma, Mama, Mama, Dharma. Dharma, there's no English translation, but it can mean duty. Duty is the first word. Mama, me is the last word of the Gita. We explained that. We explained how there's 18 chapters in the Gita. There's 18 parts to the Mahabharat. There's 108,000 verse, uh, verses in the Mahabharat. The Mahabharat is divided into 18 parts. There were 18 legions in the war, in the Pandavas and the Kauravs. There were 18 warriors described in the first chapter. What is the significance behind the number 18? We explained in the Chandogya Upanishad, it says that life is a yagna. We'll explain, we're doing yagna right now. We explain that in detail in chapter 3. Roughly translated as sacrifice, but it's not that. And yagna, and it says that 18 Brahmins are needed for yagna. So who are these Brahmins? We explain the two eyes, the two nostrils, the mouth, the different uh, sense organs. Then you've got the mind, the intellect, the memory, and the ego, which makes all of these dance. So what it said, that all of these should be trained to make life a yagna, and that's what the Gita teaches us to do. And we talked about the demons that come and interrupt the sacrifice, like negligence, wrongful desires, anger, greed, lust, all these things that come and disturb that sacrifice. Dhritarashtra asked Samjaya, the word Gita was begun by the words of Dhritarashtra. Dhritarashtra is someone that's blind, um, and it's only a blind person that needs the Gita. Not a physically blind person, spiritually blind person. He asked Samja what hap was happening in the battlefield, what are the events that took place. Samja described, uh, Duridan, uh, Duridan describing to Bhishma and Drona, all the warriors gathered, gathered together. He started describing the Pandava army first and then the Kaurav army afterwards. He became scared having looked at the Pandava army. Bhishma, being an elder, Guru Vrudh, blew his conch to cheer him up. Then all the soldiers on the Kaurav side blew their conches. Bhishma blew it first, then all the Kauri warriors. Whereas on the Pandav side, Sri Krishna blew the first conch. It wasn't a Bish, the, the leader of the Pandav army, the commander was Dushuduma. He didn't blow the conch first, it was Krishna. The war was something that was given, it was a duty given to them by the supreme soul, Krishna. Then after Krishna, you had Arjun blowing the conch. Then Bhim, the one after another, all the warriors. Look at this, Dushuduma came ninth. The charioteer was blowing the conch first. Duchiduma, the commander of the Pandav army, was blowing the conch ninth. Even the order in which the Pandavas blew the conch wasn't right. Yudhishthira was the eldest of the Pandavas, but he didn't blow the conch first. It was Arjun, Bhim, Yudhishthira, Nakul, Sadev. Completely wrong order. 
What does this show? It's completely randomness. No, it's not randomness. What it showed? There was no dryness and discipline that was found in the Corps of Army. In Corps of Army, it was Bhishma blowing it first, then everyone else. Discipline? In the Pandav Army, what it was? Doesn't matter who comes first, doesn't matter whose name comes first. We're doing this for Dharma. We're not doing this for pleasures or anything like that. We're doing it for Dharma and it doesn't matter who gets the credit. We don't care. We're all in this together. Duryodhan said, our army is apriyaptam, which means, hey, hey, you know, you see, Haraji is there. Uh, apriyaptam, whereas their army is praptam. Apriyaptam means unlimited. Praptam means limited. So in one sense, the Kaurav army was unlimited, had 11 legions. The Pandav army was limited, had 7 legions. But it's the beauty of Vyasji, who is a great poet. Aparyaptam means unlimited, but it also means not enough. And Paryaptam means enough, enough. So the Pandav army, though it was limited, it was enough. But the Kaurav army, though it was unlimited, was not enough. This shows us that it doesn't matter how many people come to do the task, it's the attitude that's important. No matter how many people get, come, if the attitude, if 500 people come, the attitude is not right, what's the point of them coming? It's not worth it. Whereas if five people come and do the job, the attitude is right, they've done their purpose. It was enough. So that happened. The Pandavas blew their conches. The sound of the conches rent the hearts of Dhritarashtra's sons. Such was their confidence. That's what the confidence you have when you're fighting for Dharma. That happened. Arjun, who's representative of the individual soul, instructed Shri Krishna. We also mentioned that um, the flag of Arjun was Hanum, uh, Hanuman, which means Kapitvaja, which actually means a monkey. Um, that's a monkey, we mentioned, is a sign of movement. Uh, we mentioned ten things in Sanskrit culture, um, in Sanskrit language. Hi. Ten things in Sanskrit language that symbolize, yeah, symbolize movement. And we went through them one by one. They all begin with K. One of them, um, we've said the Kapit Vajra, which is the flag of the monkey. So we did that, and then after that, we explained um, Arjun. His flag was Hanuman, Shri Krishna, his supreme soul, his representative of Ram. When you have Ram and Hanuman on the same side, his victory is guaranteed. We spoke, Barack Obama, since the age of eight, had the idol of Hanuman in his pocket. He lived in Bali, which is a Hindu region of Indonesia. This happened... Then you have the Kaurav army, and then now the Pandav army. Krishna, the individual soul, instructed Sri Krishna to direct him, um, to take him in front of all the Kaurav warriors on the other side. Hey, Daniel. So, we're just doing Siva Lokam. So, he instructed in front of the Kaurav warriors so he can look at his enemies. Look at verse, turn to verse 20 right now. Verse 20 right now. It says, Arjun, Ready for war, took up his bow, his Gandiva, he took up his bow, he's ready for battle. Now turn to verse 28. 26 to 28. Upon seeing his father's elders and relatives on the other side, he was overcome with compassion. All the people who said that Arjun is a coward, this proves them wrong. Arjun was not a coward. He lifted up his bow, he saw his own people on the other side, and that made him have his, this compassion creeped in. Arjun described the symptoms that came after. His skin was burning. His hair was standing on end. Gandiva, the bow was slipping from his hand. If anyone gets described these symptoms, they'll say straight away he's got low BP. Straight away. But we know that it wasn't because nowhere in the entire Gita has Sri Krishna said to Arjun, in for example chapter 10, Arjun is your skin alright? Arjun is your bow in your hands? Because it's not physical symptoms, mental symptoms. We showed how the mind is powerful over the body. Arjun, comes up with a list of excuses not to go to war, we explain that the first excuse is always the right one. Whenever you come in late to work, you say, oh, I woke up late, then the train was late, I did this, I did this. All of that wouldn't have happened if you woke up early. It's the first excuse he saw his own kinsman. So that's what happened. We explained how doubt creeps into your mind. Because when you were a baby, you had no doubts. Every single excuse Arjun comes up with was Samja went on a peacekeeping mission to the Pandavas when they were in the forest and gave them many excuses not to go to war, to hijack their minds and all these reasons are what Arjun is coming up with now. I always say this story, there were three lions, in a, uh, there were three buffaloes standing together in the jungle, they were protecting them from a lion, so they're facing with their backs to each other, so no matter where the lion comes, 
they're always protected, they're always facing on the outside. What this lion did, he went to the first buffalo. He told that buffalo, these other buffaloes don't care about you. They've been saying this and that about you. The buffalo said, no, they're my friends. Lion went away. What happened? Over time, those thoughts crept into the buffaloes. It went inside their minds. They thought, maybe, yeah, this buffalo has been saying these things about me. So that one buffalo went. What the lion did, he killed those other two buffaloes. He killed one of those buffaloes. Then he had two buffaloes standing opposite each other. What the lion thought, let me go to that other buffalo. He went to that buffalo and said, don't worry about it, he doesn't really care about you. Look at him, he's only interested in feeding his family. He's only with you because you're looking after him. Forget him. The buffalo said, no, forget about this, you're lying, I don't believe you. Lion went away. What happened? Was those thoughts crept into that buffalo's minds. That buffalo eventually thought, this lion doesn't care about me. He left. Lion ate that buffalo. And what happens to the third buffalo? Gone as well. This is what people do to your minds. Since you were a child, you had no doubts in your head. But because of what someone said to you, since you're a child up until now, is there any reason for any doubt, any lack of faith you have in yourself, it's because of that, what someone else has said. And that's what happens to Arjun. His mind got hijacked.